instance, for this lecture, we'll be talking about the origins of language, talking about where language came from, who were our first ancestors to use a language, um, and then what language looks like in the future. So it's going to be very interesting, and I hope to see some of your thoughts. So to begin this lecture, um, I first read of an article that um, said that Facebook's artificial intelligence robots shut down after they start talking to each other in their own language. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, unfortunately, this article is fake news. Remember, fake news is um, the new word of uh, the year, the word of 2017, I should say, was voted recently by the Linguistic Society of America and the American Dialect Society. But my question is, People are okay with Siri and Alexa and, you know, talking to your phones, talking to whatever, talking to Google. Um, but why are they concerned all of a sudden with AI developing their own language? And so this maybe harks back to the notion that language is something that is uniquely human. Um, and if they develop their own kind of language, that, develop, that mean, probably means they have developed their own kind of consciousness. Um, so people are kind of scared about this. But... It is fake news. I do want to assure you that it's not real. Um, and uh, But it kind of speaks to the fears of artificial intelligence and um, why, how, how does language um, kind of fit into that uh, fear. So talking about origins of language, languages in the past, languages in the future, what happens when a language die, can a language die, how does it die, and what happens when it's revitalized and it comes back to life. So, in talking about language, um, language is something that is uh, probably very recent as far as um, human creativity, human innovation uh, comes. So, if the first early humans, if the first remains of humans appeared 150,000 years ago, then we'll say language is something that um, only appeared in the last third of, uh, you know, of human existence. Uh, and we'll talk about how people are able to kind of figure out when a person is able to use a language. So, for example, um, you know, we were able to kind of figure out human remains by by looking at the fossil records and comparing, contrasting them to modern day human structures. Uh, but language is something that is pretty hard, pretty difficult to determine whether people can speak. Um, whether they can sign, uh, written language is something that is even even more recent, uh, and I'll talk about that more in my lecture on written language. But when we're talking about you know the sudden appearance of language. Um, that also, if you're a Chomskyan, if you're you know a, ra a rationalist, you will probably believe that yes, this is something that's unique. Um, to humans because this is something that is, you know, uh, language appeared because of a gene that mutated, right? Um, and so that's something that accounts for why it just happened so suddenly uh, as opposed to something that has uh, been going on for a long time. So all of the original recent languages have disappeared, um, but many more languages were spoken in the past and they, and they were much more diverse than languages that we have today. So why? Um, a part of this reasoning is that I mentioned in the last lecture in Pigeons and Creoles is that people have always needed to communicate with those who they need to communicate with. So for example, if you're a part of a tribe but you need to barter and you need to trade, um, you probably will need to know all these different languages in order to thrive. However, if you, um, you know, are separated in your own kind of culture, your own kind of group, then you don't need to venture out into other other places and learn all these different languages. So I think part of the reason why language is something that is um, much, you know, um, people are more monolingual uh, is, you know, because they've had that kind of split. But now due to globalization, people are now um, kind of venturing back out and learning all these different languages because they have different different needs too. So how did languages become so diverse? Um, there's many different theories. The first theory is the monogenesis theory, mono meaning one, genesis meaning birth. And this came um, out of this idea that there's a single origin, there's a single language, and that language became the mother tongue um, of all these different languages today. 
Um, so of course you have the mother tongue hypothesis. Uh, and so there's just one proto language and all the languages that we know of come from this language. Um, if you believe that, then you'll probably also believe some of the anthropolog anthropological theories that come with it. So the out of Africa theory suggests that uh, all humans originated from Africa. And so if that is true, then um, this language, this proto-language that a lot of humans spoke, then it also arose out of Africa as well. Or um, there's also considered a polygenesis language uh, or the candelabra hypothesis in that Instead of one mother tongue, there's actually many different tongues, and then the more recent languages kind of descended from that. So let's look at our early ancestors, um, starting with Lucy. So if you've ever been to the National um, Science and History Museum, Natural History Museum in D.C., you can actually see a skeleton of Lucy. And one of the things that you notice about Lucy is that she's actually very small. Um, she only stands about four feet tall. Um, but she is our earliest known ancestor, um, and probably dating back to 2.8 or 3.9 million years ago, where she lived Eastern Africa. So we can, you know, that ties back to the out of Africa theory. Um, as far as her language abilities, we would probably say, so she didn't really have human qualities of language, how we would think of it in a modern stance. Uh, we would probably say that her speech is more more connected to chimpanzees um, in that um, chimpanzees have a very, you know, they have a lot of, um, lots of advanced communication styles. But as far as language, their language is probably um, can amount to like the language of a two-year-old, even with things like Coco the gorilla or some of the, the animals um, that have been known to kind of produce lots of communication or, or a proto-language. So other, other instances, other facts about Lucy that kind of clue us into the fact that she didn't have language was her vocal tract. So looking at her vocal tract, her vocal tract was very ape-like. She had a high larynx and a short pharynx um, and her sounds, which means her sounds and sound were truly restricted. So your larynx is your voice box and, the, and as you remember from the phonology PowerPoint, um, your larynx really controls um, you know, the, the vocal cords vibrating, it controls most of your sounds, right? So if you have a very high larynx or your larynx didn't drop, um, it's very hard for you to manifest all those sounds. Um, and your short pharynx, so pharynx is kind of the range of the mouth. And if it's very short, that means that you can't really project your voice as you would like to. So it's very short. So um, it would be like an ape. So it would be like uh, if you've ever examined like a bird's mouth, um, how it has a very small, um, small pharynx, small vocal cavity. And so it's not exactly able to uh, realize a lot of different sounds. Um, looking at our spinal cord, you might not think the spinal cord has a lot to do with speech sounds, but it actually, spinal cord, having a large spinal cord um, means that you have a large chest cavity, which means that you have a larger uh, breathing space for your lungs in order to produce sounds. Um, and it also controls the nerves responsible for the muscles we need to coordinate breathing. Um, and you would need these complex coordination of muscles in order to vary your pitch and produce long sentences. So because she has a very narrow spinal cord, we would say that she, her speech uh, capabilities were severely limited. Her brain, looking at her brain, her brain size. Um, so brain size doesn't necessarily correlate to an intellect or anything. It's more so um, looking at the size and structure, whether or not she could use a language. Um, and so we would probably say that maybe they're able to learn. She was able to learn and understand maybe simple sign language. Um, but it's called a proto-language because it lacks the syntax and the grammar of a modern day language. And so we would probably say that it's very stunted in this regard. So looking at our next ancestor, the Turkana boy for Homo ergaster, um, also Africa, probably migrated to the parts of the Middle East and into Asia. Uh, we would also say, yes, she had limited speech and language ability. Um, and one thing we know from Lucy and Turkana boy as far as like why they are our earliest ancestors is because they walked upright. And so that's something that um, separated them from other primates. 
So one thing that we um, learn from the Turkana boy is that um, he's thought to be our first ancestor to speak a language because inside his skull, it showed an impression from Broca's area. And as you know, Broca's area is the area that's responsible for uh, speech production, speech recognition. Um, but Broca's area doesn't always function always for speech. So for example, there are lots of different areas that are used in speech, um, in language, more so than Broca's area. So just having an imprint there doesn't mean that the Turkana boy necessarily knew a uh, language or spoke a language. And also his spinal cord was only half the size of a modern modern humans. And of course, uh, you know, the narrow the narrow spinal cord, we need that for fine tuning our uh, muscles that we need for speech. And so if you don't have that, um, if you don't have a large lung capacity and large uh, capabilities for that, it's going to be very hard for you to produce a language. Another thing we can kind of figure out, you know, because we don't know, we don't have any recordings of what they sounded like or any, you know, evidence uh, physical evidence of their language, um, one of the things that we can look at is their tools, right? So if it's a really simple tool, that means that doesn't necessarily necess necessitate language. So for example, if you looked at these flint rocks, right? And I said, oh, okay, I want to make that flint rock. So I'm just going to look at you making it. I'm going to look at you and then I'm just going to make it myself, right? It's not something that's very complex or needed, you know, language, um, or some sort of communication between people when they figure out the tools. So it's very simplistic in that regard. Uh, looking at Homo Neanderthal, so when you think of um, like cavemen, this would be the Neanderthal, right? And so um, there was some time within, you know, uh, human existence in which uh, humans and Neanderthals were cohabitating on Earth. Um, so we would say that their language abilities Despite, you know, compared to Lucy and compared to the Turkana boy, I would say the Neanderthal did have language capacities. Um, they had a very limited vocal range, but they were able to produce um, some sounds, some consonants. So how do we know this? Their skull was a little bit bigger. It's more arched than those of modern humans. Um, and uh, an arch skull base allows for an extended pharynx and a lowered larynx. So that allows for a variety of sounds that can be spoken. Um, and it's also interesting to note that there are people that still look like Neanderthals. You probably still see people that look like this, right? So it's not necessarily, um, you know, that they, they're our closest ancestor because um, they have some sort of shared genes or shared uh, attributes to modern day humans and we would say that language is probably one of them. So what did Neanderthals actually sound like? So they're able to kind of replicate the vocal tracks of a Neanderthal and um, one of the things that that you know scientists have discovered and it's very strange in a way is that they actually sound very high pitched um, in that when we think of cavemen we think of someone who's very gruff and we think of someone who's like sounds like this. But actually, Neanderthals sound like this um, because their vocal tract was so short. Uh, and so you can watch this hilarious BBC video. I think it's hilarious. It's not intentionally hilarious, um, but I think it's funny because the Brits take everything very seriously. Uh, and I really want what job Elliot has in this movie, in this video. We also see um, that the hyoid, hyoid, hyoid bone so the hyoid bone is found at the top of the focal tract and it kind of um, supports the tongue muscles used in movement. Um, so we found that in the Neanderthal, um, you know, skeleton. And we said that, okay, maybe this kind of contributes to the notion that there is um, some sort of um, support for the larynx. And because of that, the larynx helps with the, you know, the vocal tract, help the vocal tract together. And so that kind of, um, contributes to this notion that, okay, so maybe they did have some sort of speech capabilities. But that's really not conclusive because pigs also have higher bones too and pigs don't have speech. So it's very difficult to pinpoint, like with Burka's area, very difficult to pinpoint this area is definitely used for speech, but this area is definitely not used for speech. 
there's um, another theory. This is a very recent uh, discovery of the FOXP2 gene. Um, so the FOXP2 gene, a lot of uh, scientists have said that, yes, this is just the gene that is used in language. Um, because when mutated, it affects the language without affecting other abilities. Um, and so a lot of anthropologists have kind of reasoned that the Neanderthals, they might have shared the same version, but this gene mutated. And so that's why um, the modern day humans have such a grasp of language, whereas the Neanderthals didn't. Um, but again, very inconclusive because there are a lot of genes, like I said, involved in language. Um, so it just takes more than one gene. Um, and if you read up on this gene, actually, this gene is found in a lot of other different species. So why haven't they mutated to form language, right? Um, so it's very, very, very interesting. And scientists have been trying to figure out the origins of language for quite some time. And um, we kind of want like a, you know, one reasoning. Um, but in reality, there might not be one reason. Um, so the Cro-Magnons, they're the homo, homo sapiens, and yes, uh, they are part of our um, ancestry. So they are, you know, are part of our species. Um, did they use language? Probably. A, they're part of our species. Um, B, they lived somewhere in, you know, the, the mountainous regions of um, Paris, or not Paris, of France and um, Spain. And so a lot of people would think that Cro-Magnons um, are uh, speakers of Basque. And so that's where Basque came from. Because if you think about the language Basque is so different from other European languages. And it's so different from Spanish and so different from French. And so uh, they said, well, maybe this is an early ancestor, early speaker of Basque. Um, and that, you know, that evidence is still inconclusive to date. So their skull, like the Neanderthal, was a, a third bigger. Um, and, you know, having a bigger skull, uh, an arch skull, um, kind of helps out with the vocal tract and the expanded, uh, the dropped larynx and the expanded pharynx. Um, and then the physical features are identical with Cro-Magnons and people living today. So we would say that, yes, you know, because there are people that look like this, um, that they are part of our species. So the reason why, um, you know, even though Cro-Magnons Magnons are part of Homo sapiens, and their skull was larger. Why are modern day humans? Why are their skulls smaller? Um, because having a larger skull would have a larger brain capability, right? Um, and so the reason for this is um, childbirth. It's very, very, very um, dangerous, and for a you know a woman to give birth to someone with a big head. Um, so um, because of this, a lot of people would say that. Uh, well, um, our evolutionary scholars would say that our brains have kind of sh shrunk um, in that aspect. So um, if you have a big head, you can um, blame our ancestors for that. Um, so we have no evidence of their writing, but we do have evidence of their art. So when you think about art, art is something that's very symbolic, highly symbolic, right? If you need to not only do you need to be able to draw something and have other people interpret it, but you're not just drawing something for kicks and giggles. You're drawing something because it means something or you want other people to kind of get something from it. So um, when we think about art, art is kind of like language in that way. You need a form of shared communication and you need a form of understanding. Um, and so because of this, we would say that if um, there is some sort of art capabilities, or we, or we, you know, found some, this sort of art in cave drawings, then we would say, um, yes, this is something that that points to the fact that they might have had a language because um, they have this this um, this shared sense of understanding. And of course, looking at their tools, so compare these tools. Contrast this with the tools. Um, earlier that you saw for Sharkana Boy, and you see that these tools are very refined. So this is something that you probably couldn't um, understand from just imitating or just watching someone make these tools. These tools are something that you would probably need um, to understand, uh, that, that needs design or that you need um, 
you need some sort of shared communication or language in order to make these tools. So how do we know what a language sounded like in the past? Uh, first of all, we can study some historical documents. So for example, uh, in Romeo and Juliet, Benfolio says, "'Tis in fain to seek him that means not to be found." And Romeo says, "'Ye just had scars that never felt a wound.'" So because of this, we can kind of figure out that in Shakespearean time, found and wound probably rhymed uh, because it would sound better. Um, so we probably would know that. Or in Chaucer, he says, "'I ask why the fifth man was not husband to the Samaritan.'" Right. And so we know, uh, based on Chaucer's uh, explanation, that ax is actually uh, a form of ask. And through, the, through uh, metathesis, so like kind of um, rearranging the, the syllables and in, in, um, the you know, consonants, we're kind of able to figure out, oh, okay, so um, ask, ax used to be the form that they would say before ask. Uh, and that shows evidence of language change. And we're also able to figure out um, how language is related by comparing it with other languages. So we know English is very close to German because if you say one, two, three, four, five, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, this sounds very similar than it does to Vietnamese. And so we would say, okay, well, English sounds very similar to German and probably very different from Vietnamese. Uh, but be careful because there are some false cognates. So this is um, a map of the Indo-European languages. Um, so you'll notice that some languages, um, so English is on here, for example. English and German and lots of different European languages. Um, there's at least three European languages that are not on here, which are Basque, which I talked about earlier, um, Finnish, and Hungarian are not on here. And so Finnish and Hungarian are a Uralic language. Um, and so even though, you know, it's based up Europe, or these languages are spoken in Europe, um, they're very, very, very different. And so that could kind of, um, that could kind of represent some of the languages that have been spoken. And due to forms of migration, some of the languages have moved around. Um, and then other, you know, there's other language families. And so it's very difficult to kind of piece together, you know, what languages are uh, very, very similar. Some of you wrote on your discussion board post that you're, you're trying to learn this language or that language. And you're talking about, you know, which languages are quote unquote easier, which, are, which languages are quote unquote harder. And so by easier and hard, there's nothing really um, intrinsic about learning a language that's easy versus hard. So, for example, kids in China will learn Chinese very easily, right? Kids in America learn English very easily. Um, but it's from the perspective of what your native language is. So, for example, if you speak English, some of these languages might be very easy for you, such as Swedish or Dutch. Swedish and Dutch are probably very easy for you to learn. Um, but it would be very hard for you to learn a language like Pashto um, or Persian or Kurdish, even though it is from the same kind of language family and so um you know even even if the words are similar or some of the language forms are similar or their syntax is similar um they might not be you know even though they're related it might be very difficult to kind of figure out what languages are easy versus hard in this context so how does a language die so um first of all language all uh, language are always um there are some languages that are um, very prevalent, like English and Mandarin and Hindi, like these languages will be around for a while. But as far as the other languages, a language dies every 14 days. So every two weeks or so, a language will die. And language dies when its speakers are die, the speakers die. So this could happen very suddenly. So for example, uh, a lot of, in Tasmania, which is an island off of Australia, all the languages, um, died out because the speakers died of genocide. So um, the speakers are the only thing that kind of carry on the language. Uh, we have an instance from Nicolenio, which is a Native American language. Um, so this language uh, died because of, you know, genocide of Native Americans. Um, Chumai, spoken in a single village in Brazil, um, but then the flu came and it wiped out all the speakers. Uh, everyone died. So then, you know, no one speaks that anymore. Um, 
it could also be something to where the people don't die, but then they, the, the speakers, they stop using the language out of fear, out of political repression, out of genocide. So, for example, uh, a lot of Native American languages died this way because even though there are some people that, um, you know, Native Americans survived, um, some were put into homes uh, where they were fostered by lots, lots of European families, and so because of that, they were um, taught not to speak their Native American language, um, and so because of that, they only learned English. Um, there's also an uprising in El Salvador that killed 25,000 peasants, uh, and so the languages, and it was a failed rebellion, so afterwards the government really cracked down on the language because language is something that's very tied to identity, and if you, um, you know, again, like we saw with uh, the slave ships in the last recording, if you want to, um, you know, quelch some sort of identity or uh, if you want to stop a rebellion or, you know, take some sort of something away from its people, language is something that you could do in order to make them feel inferior or they don't... Um, you know, have a sense of pride or identity or, um, you know, recognition about who they are. Um, this is very common, gradual language that so it's not so much that's like there's genocide or people, there's fear of speaking language. Um, sometimes it's just that they're, you know, this is something that's very common uh, in immigrants. For example, immigrants, when you come to America, uh, you might learn your your parents will speak your language, you might speak some of the language, but your children might not speak any of the language of the of your parents. And so um, it's fewer and fewer children, because children are really the key for maintaining uh, language, as we saw with pigeons and creoles, and we saw for our language acquisition. Um, so there's fewer and fewer children learning the language until there's no more language learners. Uh, language speakers and so there's uh, this happened to Cornish in Britain this happened to a lot of Native American languages um, where English kind of sets the um, you know set, sets the tone and people um, don't have a need to speak their native languages anymore and so because of that they um, they just you know have a gradual language death um, so what happens when uh, language gets resurrected so um, what there's what happened uh, this happened with Hebrew um, and Latin and so um, language is only being used in certain contexts so Latin is what they call a dead language but is it really dead because a lot of people use it in law and medicine and a lot of different words that we speak, right? So Latin is still very with us today, even though no one speaks it fluently as a language anymore. Hebrew in the past, uh, in the past, um, you know, Hebrew was only learned for a lot of uh, people of Jewish descent. So for example, if you're Jewish, you probably have learned Hebrew um, in synagogue, or you probably learned it to recite from the Torah at your um, bat mitzvah. But um, you probably didn't know much other than that. And so uh, now Hebrew is used um, as a, uh, it's no longer used as just a language that's only being used in specific instances because it's now the national language of Israel. Um, and, you know, these people speak Hebrew um, as their native language now. So um, this shows proof, Hebrew shows proof that there is a chance for language revitalization, that there are efforts made to preserve the language. Um, we'll talk about how and we'll talk about why. So first of all, Cherokee. Cherokee is something, um, you know, because of the history of lots of Native American languages being, um, you know, wiped out, um, now a lot of people in um, Cherokee, areas, especially uh, North Carolina where I'm from, um, they are now learning as children. There are speci specified Cherokee immersion schools where the students, the kids all learn Cherokee as their native language. And so it's very cute. Everyone's very cute. Um, and um, it's very expensive. Not only do you need to have stakeholders, you can get government grants, but in this instance, in North Carolina, a lot of the money that's used to fuel the schools is from the neighborhood casinos. 
Um, and so if you're ever in Cherokee, North Carolina, you should go gamble if you're a gambling age because um, it helps support the schools. Yeah, so how do they have the funds to sustain the language revitalization program? Because it's very hard when you think about having materials, having teachers, training the teachers, um, you know, building the school. It takes a lot of effort from the parents. It takes a lot of effort from the school, the community, the government. Um, but you need some sort of hard cash in order to uh, produce these uh, language revitalization funds. Welsh is something uh, that's being revitalized. Um, and so I had a friend who went to University of Wales, and he's English. Um, but he says that every single thing that he receives like a letter or like a tuition bill, everything is written in Welsh first. And then the second paper is English. And that really is a sense of saying, okay, we really want to make this language primary, right? And so we're going to put it as first. Um, and so even though he doesn't understand Welsh, and then there's actually a lot of people that don't understand Welsh, um, they make an effort to say, no, we're going to put this as first. And so it's very symbolic in this way. You can watch this fun video on lots of different Welsh words. Gaelic, if you've ever been to Ireland, uh, you look at the signs, right? Everything is written in Gaelic first, and then English second. And if you're an English speaker like me, you just ignore whatever is in green, and you look at what's ever in black. And a lot of people don't find this to be annoying. They just, I mean, I'm sure lots of people, lots of tourists probably find it annoying. But for the people themselves, they find it as a sense of national pride. Um, because a language, like I said, is part of your history. And so um, you, you know, even if you don't speak the language yourself, you're really proud of having that there. You know, it's like, I don't know what this means, but I'm glad it's there. Uh, Hawaiian, we talked about Hawaiian last class, so Hawaiian pigeon or Hawaiian Creole. Um, so what's the biggest selling point of revitalizing a language? Uh, tourism for Hawaii. So a lot of people, like I said in last lecture, they go to Hawaii and they say, um, oh, I want to be in a distant land or I want to, you know, speak different things, you know, I want to eat different things and I want to, you know, meet with different people and speak a different language, right? And so um, it's, it's something to where now it becomes this great language to learn because it adds some sort of um, physical monetary commodity. So if you watch Moana, Moana features a lot of the Samoan and the Tokalawan language. Um, but consider the fact that if you've ever watched Moana, that the they probably have some of the songs in Samoan, some of the words in Samoan, and some of the you know names in the you know in the Polynesian languages. But most of it's in English, if you consider that. So a lot of it is symbolic and a lot of it is, you know, we're very proud of this language. Um, but again, if you consider the fact that they didn't have it all in Samoan, just with English subtitles, pretty much everything was in English besides the fact that, you know, some of the things were, um, the native terms were in, in the Polynesian languages, but mostly in English though. So. Talking about the future, what does language look like in the future? Are emojis considered a language? We'll also talk about that in written language. Um, but, you know, talking about what I said earlier in, uh, you know, teaching a computer to learn a language, having computers speak a language, right? Can we teach computers to speak a language? Um, here's language in the news. This is a... Uh, video about a man who makes a robot that looks like a famous celebrity, although it's very clear who the celebrity is. Um, and think about the ways that he has the robot speak different languages. Um, so here's some, you know, the first um, kind of computer programmed language that they used was was um, a computer program designed by Joseph Weizenbaum in the 1960s. So what he did was he was able to figure out the syntax of spoken speech, and then he turned that into um, how people would communicate. And so um, he named his computer program Eliza, and he said, uh, you know, someone would type into it, and so he would have his secretaries like type in 
and say, my head hurts. And the wiser would say, why do you say your head hurts, right? So it seems like um, it's very natural because all it's doing is taking whatever you're saying and kind of flipping it around. Um, the problem with Eliza and with a lot of computer computer programming, Alexa, Siri, um, is that they're not very good at recognizing um, sarcasm and they're not very good at recognizing um, different meanings uh, or pragmatic such as some things. So for example, if you say, my mother hates me, Eliza will respond, who else in your family hates you, right? Eliza, you bitch. Um, so it's, it's you know, uh, even though Eliza, you know, is a computer program, uh, she's not really programmed to kind of understand like, oh, what you're saying to me is that you're having some sort of conflict with your mom, right? And so um, I think computer technology, and this might have changed because this is in the 1960s, um, but we're still not there yet uh, as providing, you know, therapy by computers. Uh, here's an excerpt um, from one of Weizenbaum's assistants. Uh, so his assistant wrote, men are all alike. And Eliza writes, in what way? They're always bugging us about something or another. Eliza says, can you think of a specific example? And the assistant says, well, my boyfriend made me come here. Eliza says, your boyfriend made you come here. He says, I'm depressed to hear, I'm, he says I'm depressed most of the time, most of the time. And Eliza says, I'm sorry to hear that you are depressed. So it kind of sounds like the, if you're my age, the AOL, like chat robot, it's kind of sounds like a chat robot, right? It's like, how do you know whether you're talking to a human being or a robot? Because um, these are something, you know, the communication lines might be blurred, especially if we teach, um, we teach computers to, or we program computers to kind of understand more about language. Um, but the one thing that I noticed from this excerpt is that even though the person, you know, the assistant knows that she's talking to a computer, she's still treating it like a human being. She's still responding to it like a human being. And so what are the lines between, you know, communication when we are, um, you know, especially like talking to our smartphone, we're talking to the TV, you know, everything is like, to we're talking to our cars, you know, what are the lines of animacy between um, how we think of things as objects and how we think of things as humans, especially when we think of language as something that's very human. Um, this is kind of what I was talking about when um, I was saying that computer programs have a very hard time of figuring out um, what the meaning of what you're trying to say is. So for example, what are all the possible meanings of the sentence? I made her duck. So it could mean I cooked waterfowl like a duck for her. I cooked waterfowl belonging to her. I cooked her duck. I created the plastic duck she owns. I made her duck. I caused her to quickly lower her body. I made her duck. Or I waved my magic wand and turned her into a waterfowl. I made her duck. I made her into a duck, right? So the computer language processing tries to reconcile all these ambiguities in a language. So for example, when we are talking to Siri, um, Siri tries, first of all, Siri waits until you're done with your sentence because it knows that we don't parse things out on a word by word basis. Uh, it waits until it finishes the sentence. It says, okay, let me, you know, send this up to the cloud to see if I need um, any sort of um, explanation um, to where you know I can I can use that knowledge and then Siri itself has its own kind of bank of information um, that it's working from and so um, once it figures out from the cloud that says okay it says I have enough information then I can present you with what I have and all of this is happening in lightning speed and so um, you know consider all of this uh, here are the discussion questions for this week Discussion question one is talking about language revitalization. So for example, given the examples of language that have been revitalized, what are some aspects that make for successful language revitalization? So for example, there's a New York Times article um, that just came out two, a week ago. Uh, or you can consider why languages like Esperanto haven't been very successful in the US. Give specific ways, uh, or sorry, give it specific, specific examples of languages and a ways in which the community has advocated for the minority language despite influences of English or other dominant tongues. So you can talk about Spanish, for instance, in the United States, 
Uh, you can talk about different languages, minority languages, um, Hawaiian, for instance, Cherokee. What are, what are some ways in which these languages have been um, revitalized? And what, what are some factors that help them revitalize? Like why? You might have to do some external research for that. And the discussion question two would be discuss the future of language and interacting and how we will communicate in the future. For example, how do you notice children interacting with technology such as smartphones or cloud-based services such as Alexa or Google Home? Will AI eventually learn to communicate using the known language, right? Bridging back to that fake news, right? Um, so more or less, is this the future, right? So this is a screenshot from uh, the movie Her where a uh, man falls in love with a computer. Um, so is this, is this what we're going to do? Is this all we're going to do is keep talking to um, inanimate objects? Um, you can talk about that, reflect on that, and I will see you on the discussion board.